members, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. You didn't dance through the intro this time. I was just thinking, I was like, I didn't hear the music as, as you talked this time. Oh. I must have been, my mind must be somewhere else. Okay, great. <laughs> I do feel kind of sleep deprived, so it may be one of those nights. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, um, my allergies have been terrible yeah. this week. Um, and, you know, my allergies are already bad, and I take Claritin every day and so on. But, um, but it's, been, it's been really bad this week. And last night I got, I think I fell asleep sometime after 3. Well, I know I fell asleep sometime after 3. Yeah. Um, and I woke up before 6. Oh, so you got you a few hours then. Yeah, probably like <laughs> two hours and two and a half hours maybe. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Solid. Yeah, so I'm feeling good. Yeah. Um, this is going to be a nice sleep-deprived episode. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that my left eye is ready to pop out of my skull. Yeah. So. Uh, there's great, definitely great something in the air. Everybody's got allergy problems right now, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, we've had a good, It's it's been pretty windy, so it may just be the pollen. Mm. It's getting kicked up, you know. Yeah, it could be. Um, I was trying to reclaim some parts of my driveway this weekend, too, and yeah. Yeah. digging so you, around. So you were that. out there, in it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and man. pulling up, uh, you know, decades worth of pollen. Right. <laughs> yeah, not just recent, but. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, good man. times. Yeah. Uh, I guess before we go anywhere, um, it's Mother's Day this weekend, so happy Mother's Day to yeah. all the mothers out there. Yeah. The ones we so. know and the ones we don't. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I've, huh. I've named people in the past. I'm, I feel like I'm not going to do that <laughs> yeah, this year. Not, not going to call anybody out specific. No. no, no reason for that. Why dox them, you know? No, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh there was something you were talking about before we got started, and I thought that that might be some interesting lead in, and now I can't remember what it was. So, oh well. I don't remember. <laughs> I remember talking about stuff, but I don't know what what you would have thought would have been. Um. So, uh, more excitement for the Libertarian Party convention. RFKJ is going to be there also. That's cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, originally, he was wanting to try to go for the nomination, but I think he's kind of got because he wanted ballot access, and I think he's mm-hmm. pretty well claimed as ballot access from his um, new VP pick. Yeah, probably. I mean, they have the money to spend. Yeah, because yeah, that's what I mean. I think he needed the ballot access, and it was a question of getting it through the LP or spending the money to get it itself. So I think he just found a, a VP to be the money person. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, and I was able to upgrade my ticket to the LP convention. Did somebody reach out to you from the podcast? Yeah. So, so thank you, Patrick, (laughs) for (laughs) finally responding to me. Um, no, and it was from the LP. It wasn't like somebody who listened to the podcast. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, maybe, but uh, (laughs) he was like, oh, I need to take care of those, these guys. (laughs) But, uh, so yeah, thank you, Patrick, for sending me a link to get everything updated. And I took care of that. So. Yeah. Well, oh, cool. Although I I did lose my early bird discount, but oh well. Yeah. So you'll be getting to see RFK and Trump. Uh, well, RFK and Trump are both speaking on the floor. Yeah. I'm so assuming. The, yeah. But yeah. So, one is uh, RFK's Friday, and I think Trump's Saturday. If yeah. I'm not mistaken. No, I was already going to be able to see them. Yeah. That, like the basic ticket package called, took care of that. Yeah. Covers everything on the floor. Actually, it covers the breakout sessions too, which I think is really cool of them. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, it is like the basics. So it's like what happens on the main convention floor and the breakout sessions, um, and a few other like little things. But yeah. it, like the opening, opening and closing, whatevers and yeah. things like that. Dave um, Smith's supposed to speak too, right? Yeah, that's why I wanted upgraded. Oh, okay. Um. So they're then they have lunch and dinner. No, breakfast and lunch, lunch and dinner. I don't remember. They have meal speakers also and yeah. m- meals provided. So you like yeah. you have a sit down meal uh, with a speaker um, that isn't part of the basic package. Gotcha. And 
Uh, there's a couple of levels of that. Now, this is actually one of the things that I like about the way the Libertarian Party does the conventions is that you can kind of pay for what you want. Yeah. Like it's it's um, highly custom. Your experience is highly customizable. <laughs> yeah. You don't um, have to buy. With, yeah, different uh, costs for what you want. Yeah. So my upgrade gives me a couple of um, meal tickets. Yeah. So uh, my plan really is to see Dave Smith and to see uh, Dr. Peter McCullough. Oh, yeah. Okay. I forgot he so was going to be So those are the two there. speakers that I really want to see. Yeah. Um, that are doing meal speeches that, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be cool. Um, it's kind of a shame because then they'll be serving me, you know, like a dining hall style meals instead of me going and eating place someplace good in DC. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I'm sure you'll have some opportunities to go do that. Oh right? no, I, I definitely will. Yeah. Uh, the, the hotel is like a couple of blocks from where my brother and his wife used to live. Yeah. And, um, in Adams Morgan. So it's an area you're familiar with. Well, sort of. I mean, it's been a long time since I've been there. Yeah. Um, I did. I, I don't. I don't know if my brother listens to this. I don't think that he does. But, uh, but Daniel, <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, um, I was looking at the map and I saw a, a bar called the uh, the Blackguard, which I'm pretty sure was like his local bar that he went to regularly. So if that's yeah. correct, like, let me know. Um, I'll definitely stop by there. Actually, I'll yeah. probably, You're probably definitely gonna end stop up there by there anyway. anyway. Come on, it's yeah. a bar and <laughs> well, but there's walking distance bars. from you. <laughs> no, I mean, but this is like a, this is like the trendy area of DC, so there's yeah. lots of bars. Well, good within walking distance. You'll probably sample them all, right? It is perfect for a Libertarian Party convention, <laughs> right? <laughs> really is. A lot of different kinds of food too. Yeah, we're not far from the um, the uh, embassy homes. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so we can go uh, protest outside of various embassy homes <laughs> if we you want. You can go egg them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> TP the embassy home yeah. of the French. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, if that happens, I really didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> right. And tell people to do it either, right? No, no. no. So this is for comedic purposes only. There you go. Um, <laughs> So uh, anyway, it, it's a it's an it's a neat part of DC to be in, and yeah. um, I think it's going to be a really good time. And uh, um, I'm pretty sure Anthony's going. That's what I heard. Yeah, hadn't seen him in a while. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Um. So I want to say I saw a list of delegates, and he may have been on it. Okay. They. Uh, I talked to our state chair the other day, and he said that. Um, that they had a somebody a delegate drop out and that they were probably going to move Anthony. That Anthony had precedent for that position if he was still oh, going. Okay. So that must have been what happened. May have been. Um, but he was calling to make sure that I was still going, in case. Yeah. So, so I'll probably end up being a delegate for at least part of the time that I'm up there. Well, I yeah. said that that was going to happen anyway, but now the state chair has called me and told me <laughs> that. So nice. Um, feel yeah. more confident in that, which is kind of good and kind of bad. Yeah. Um, uh, I've actually, I'm trying to think, I don't, I don't think I've ever been to, um, a national convention where I wasn't a delegate. Yeah. And I was so, kind of looking forward to the, like not having anything required of me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so do you, um, where are you at as far as the candidates for the nomination? I have no idea. Okay, so you're going to kind of get up yeah. there, listen to everybody, and kind of make a decision yeah. up there? Yeah. Because um, I don't, uh, me personally, I don't, I mean, I've listened to, I mean, I know we had Mike Tier on the podcast. Yeah. And Termot. I like Termot. Yeah. I, I don't know why I want to say Tier. Uh -huh. I guess that's what it looks like when I read it. Yeah. Um, and I liked him, but I'm not firm on any of them. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like, I, if I was going, I would be listening and paying attention to kind of make some decisions. I mean, most of them are good on. They're good libertarians. Well, I was going to say, there's, so, there, at least from what I've seen, there's nobody that I'm like adamantly against. Yeah. Um, now that could change as I listen to them, but um, <laughs> yeah, as you hear more from them, there yeah. there are a few people on the on that list that I um, that I just don't know anything about. And yeah. then there's um, so Chase Oliver 
is on that list. Yeah. Do you remember him? I do. Yeah. Um, that's the guy that I got in the argument about, about the Russia Ukraine <laughs> thing, uh, yeah. at our state convention a couple of years ago. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, a couple um, of years back. Yeah. But I do, I mean, I he's, do remember he's a, him. That makes it sound bad. I like him. He's a nice guy. Yeah. Um, and he's he's sharp and he, you know. And I think he's good on a lot of issues, yeah. not just one one of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but like you need a little education. <laughs> but that that's kind of disqualifying for me. So unless he's moved on that issue, I, yeah. he's he's not going to get my vote. Um, yeah. I did get invited to a town hall of his tomorrow, I think, but I'm, I'm not going to attend. I don't. I don't, yeah. I, I hope to have other plans. <laughs> <laughs> you hope, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a Friday night, so <laughs> <Yeah>. we'll see. <laughs> um, and then, uh, oh, who's the guy? Josh Smith. Yeah. Um, I like Josh, Josh Smith. He's a little polarizing, but I kind of like yeah. that about him. Yeah, there's some level where you're looking, and when you're looking at a presidential candidate, a guy that's like really in your face is not. Yeah, and entirely he's entirely what you want. Yeah, but as libertarians and being kind of where we're at as a party, I mm-hmm. don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. No, um, I, the radicals are are the people that li- really drive change. Yeah, uh, you need the radicals out there. the The radicals are the you know the the um. Oh man, I had the word in my head: the vanguard. Oh, That's yeah. what I was going for. The yeah. radicals are the vanguard. The radicals are the ones that get out there and upset people, but but push outside of what people are used to hearing. Move that Overton window exactly. Yeah. Um. And but but they don't usually accomplish their goals. They just yeah. They they uh they kind of like seed the ground for the yeah. people that can come back there behind them and um and talk about the same things, but in a way that draws people instead of (laughs) turning them off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't think he's the guy either. Yeah. Uh, I liked Mike Termont also. There were some things that we talked about on the podcast that I didn't really agree with his take on. You're never going to find the perfect candidate as a libertarian anyway. So that's, (laughs) you know, we're, we're short, way, of, short of Ron Paul. <laughs> well, even Ron Paul, I I don't agree with on everything. Yeah. Um, we're just we're just highly individualistic people, and so yeah. you can. I don't know. It's it's not like um, I think particularly the Democrats, but the Republicans to a degree also, where everybody kind of falls into lockstep. That just does not happen in the Libertarian yeah. Party. Well, and. So to kind of go to go off that, um, for me at least, as as my time in the party, Ron Paul is really the only one that all libertarians really kind of get gravitated to, um, mm-hmm. because I remember particularly during the 2012 campaign, like there wasn't a libertarian that was like against Ron Paul. Like yeah. he was running as a Republican, libertarians didn't care. Mm-hmm. Like that was our guy. And libertarians of all stripes and shapes were behind him. Yeah. And we haven't had that since. Yeah, that's um, true. And, and that's really what we need, is we need a libertarian that can kind of carry the torch that all libertarians can be like, all right, this is our guy. Yeah. Um, and the only, to be truthful with you, the only person I see out there right now that could be that torchbearer is Spike. Um, and... I don't know that he, he, I mean, obviously he's not Ron Paul, yeah. but I don't know of any other libertarians that, that are just, that every libertarian can kind of get behind. Is he, is he running for the presidential nomination? I don't think nomination? so. Uh, no. Yeah, I don't remember No, but I'm just saying as far as like people okay. that are out there, like I say, and we'll see kind of what shakes out at the convention this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll be interesting to see who we end up with and how libertarians unite around that person. Yeah. Um, but I know four years ago we didn't have it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I didn't even vote for the libertarians, so um, that's saying something. Yeah. I mean, and then the the Mises Caucus candidate is Michael Rechtenwald. Yeah. Um, and he's a, he, he's followed a lot of the path that I have. Like, he's a reformed Marxist. Yeah. Um, he's, an, he's good on... Just about everything. Like I was going to say, I don't have any policy disagreements with him, at least not from what I've heard. Yeah. It's just a little dry. <laughs> yeah. He just, he, he's not a candidate that 
it's easy to get excited about. Exactly. And, and especially if you're not a libertarian, I think. Yeah. Um, so, um, but what you're saying about Ron Paul there, I, I th- you're, you're right um, in that we haven't had another person that represented libertarianism that, that all libertarians got behind. But he's also the only candidate that represented libertarianism that had a big following nationwide. Yeah. Like, I think that you might not be able to say that. I, I think that if a, a Gary Johnson had been polling at 30% nationwide or something like that, people <laughs> yeah. would have gotten behind him, even though he's oh, not perfect on everything. No, I, I agree um, with that. I, I think that the that Ron Paul's general popularity, like popularity in the general population, yeah. um, had a, played a, a big role in how much and support he got from the libertarian. Kind of, the libertarians yeah. kind of closing ranks with him. Yeah. Uh, you may be right about that, yeah. um, but I don't know. Yeah. I, and I, I've i come around on Ron Paul. Um, I know there's so many libertarians out there that it's like Ron Paul made them libertarian. Like yeah. they're libertarian because of Ron Paul. Yeah. It wasn't Ron Paul to me. It was Harry Brown. Harry Brown's <laughs> the guy that, <laughs> the, made that brought you over. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I actually had I some voted issues for him <laughs> <laughs> in my yeah. first election. The, the, yeah. The first presidential in. election that yeah. I actually voted in, I voted for him. Yeah. The first um, one I was eligible. That's who I voted. That for. was not the first one I was eligible for. I didn't vote yeah. in the first one I was eligible for. Yeah. I just didn't pay any attention to politics yeah. at all. Like right out of high school like that, that would have been 96. Yeah. Um, would have been the first election that I was able to vote for a president. Yeah. I just, I didn't care. You wasn't in it. Like, yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. not involved, not engaged at all. Um, but, uh, I, you know, for a long time I was kind of critical of Ron Paul, but it wasn't really, it wasn't his policies or, or his, I do have some trouble with the way he speaks cause he's just hard to follow. He doesn't finish sentences. He bounces from one thing to another without like, like there's some associative leaps that, that if you're just listening to him, you miss, like yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't follow through with his speech from one topic to another. He just, he kind of, it sounds very, um, I don't know. Uh, like broken up kind of. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's not very focused. It's, it just yeah. seems very unfocused. Yeah. Um, on the whole, a lot, a lot of libertarians have that problem though, because like so much of this one thing leads to another and you kind of got to have the whole context to understand it. And yeah. I'm, I'm probably criticizing him for something that people listening to the podcast are like, listen to yourself, Michael. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, but, but anyway, yeah. uh, I, the issue I had was this kind of cult of personality. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, around him. Um, yeah. I, I thought that like, the personality of Ron Paul drew more attention or than what the man had to say in the substance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and it, it, that's still true to some degree, but he's not in the game quite so much. And so, yeah. um, I, I appreciate more of what he has to say now. And I think that he's, he's not just a, a like a figurehead or, um, you know, he's not he's not like libertarian Jesus anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. know. He'll always have that for me. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's not it, he doesn't have that draw on the whole like he used to where it's yeah. like you like him because he's Ron Paul. Yeah. Like, oh, well, it's just but it's Ron Paul. Yeah. You, you know, there's that kind of attitude towards well, him. And um, I, I don't maybe it hasn't dissipated. Maybe it's just uh, it's not as prevalent as it used to be because he's, he's just, just not, not in involved in yeah. as much as he used to. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Well, the thing that always amazed me with Ron Paul is he'd go on Fox news and these things and they'd mm-hmm. ask him like tough libertarian questions. And he could always just like spit out the, the libertarian response. Yeah. So well, well, um, he's principled. He, he sticks to first principles and everything follows from that. It's not. Yeah. It, well, and, and I contrast that with Gary Johnson because they were running around mm. the same time, the first go round, and like Gary Johnson wasn't capable of doing that. Yeah, like there but, were some things that he was really good.
good on that he had his like talking points prepared. Yeah. yeah. And things that he wasn't. Yeah. If, if when any time and any time they throw Ron Ball a curveball, he would swing it right back at him. But yeah. Gary Johnson couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so. certainly true. Well, you know, that's one of the things that they always say. Like if you if you're reliant on um, a a bunch of policy positions. It's hard to answer everything. It's easy but to if get you're, tangled up. Yeah, but if you're if you just you know bring everything out, draw everything out from from first principles. Yeah. Like as long as you have your principles, then all the answers are easy. Yeah, you just follow your yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, there are some questionable things. There's some weird little gray areas in libertarianism. That's certainly yeah. sure. Um, I actually was listening to. Um, I'm trying to think of what the the topic was, oh, uh, I was listening to part of the problem, Dave Smith's show, um, Dave and Rob Bernstein, and they were talking about the uh, um, releasing of sexually explicit material of oh, exes and yes, all that. I remember that, that stuff. Yeah. Um, he told, he said on there that there's some words that you're not allowed to say on YouTube. We, so we should be I, careful we've of had, those. Yeah, we've had more than enough YouTube Strikes. videos taken down. Yeah. So. <laughs> They're still taking stuff down for medical misinformation on our account, which drives me crazy. Because <laughs> right. at this point, we've been proven to be right. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway. Um, and, uh, and I was saying, well, I could make that argument from both sides. Yeah. The, you know, Dave's argument was that at the time that the pictures or video or whatever was taken, it was consensual. Yeah. And the pictures once, are your property. And now it's your property. And so yeah. you can do with it as you please. Yeah. Um, but I could say that it, I could certainly make the case that it's an aggression against the other person to release that stuff publicly because you're doing it with the intent of embarrassing or humiliating or, um, or causing damage to their life with it. Yeah. Right. So, like I can see both sides of that argument very easily. Yeah. And I think that both follow from libertarian principles. And so you got to decide which takes precedent. That, like, yeah. So there are, um, there are plenty of, of issues that, um, uh, abortion is another one. Actually. It is. Yeah. Um, uh, immigration is one, even yeah. voting. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, so there are, you know, plenty of issues that you can take a good principled libertarian, um, stance on either side of the issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so with the, the voting, that one is that are, if you are using your vote to, um, use the force of government to take from somebody else or to oppress or to whatever, to reallocate their property to you or to something else or to where you think it should go, like that's aggression. Yeah. You know, so I, I tend to um, agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then, so there's a lot of, of libertarians that don't vote because of that. Yeah, they because, see it as because an aggressive e action. Because either direction they vote, they feel like that they're, mm -hmm. they're imposing on somebody else. Right. Um, but then you can take the other side of it. And this was Lysander Spooner's argument yeah. is that, um, that, I'm, I vote in self-defense. Yeah, that's if I'm not yeah. using if I'm not using my vote to defend my property, then other people are using their vote to take mine. Exactly. And so, therefore, I have to vote uh, in self-defense. It's a it's a self-defensive action. It's yeah. not an aggressive action. So, you yeah. Know. Um, anyway, that's fun stuff. <laughs> Nobody cares about this. I'm, I'm like, there's, yeah. if you're not a libertarian, you're listening to this and you're going, what the? <laughs> yeah, right. this is nitpicky stuff. Who cares? Right. Um, I love these. But this is how libertarians are. Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. Go to the libertarian I was convention. Say, Mike's go, fixing to go to a convention of nothing but this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go out and have drinks with some of these people. You'll find out this is exactly yeah. the way the discussions go at tables. Oh, so at 100%. Um, so so uh, one thing I, I wanted to clarify from the last episode, I, I know that I said that the um, the HR 6090, the anti-Semitism definition thing, uh, was an addendum to the Civil Rights Act. Yeah, I don't because talking to you later, you said it wasn't it wasn't clear to you. So maybe it was I, not. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't make it clear. I guess that at this time, um, them adopting that definition of anti-Semitism only affects institutions that are federally funded. Yep. Yeah. Or that actually, I should say that accept federal funds. Yeah. Which means every college and university, almost there's like a couple that don't take 
federal student loans. That's federal funding. Like, yeah. it, you know, so, um, but it is being used. It, it Them accepting that definition of anti-Semitism is how they justified breaking up the protests. Yeah. And the point that I was trying to make, though, with that is now that, that they have accepted the IHRA's um, definition of anti-Semitism as a legal definition of anti-Semitism for the purposes of the Civil Rights Act, it's easy to now apply that to any other um, federal legal issue. Yeah. So that's the point that I was trying to make. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're sliding down that slippery slope here. <laughs> yes. Now, um, Judge Napolitano talked about this, and he's, he was very confident. I, I have to say I don't share his confidence. Yeah. Um, but he was very confident that if this were brought, it, as soon as this is brought up in court, it will be enjoyed. It'll be, it'll be struck down. Yeah. 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 Um, now, I would just say that, <laughs> that there's, I don't understand why the United States would accept the definition of some kind of discrimination as the definition provided by an advocacy organization for that group. <laughs> that seems like a bad plan. Seems to like me. they're a little biased, right? Yeah. Um, I just think that's that's dumb. Yeah. Uh, but the the real problem, obviously, uh, and of course with that definition, is that it just identifies a whole lot of things that are criticisms, legitimate criticisms of the state of Israel, yeah, the government of Israel um, as anti-Semitic, well, and the, it, the, so they're they're criminal. All right, I'm going to try not to use the word criminalizing in this case. Um, they're at least stigmatizing political speech uh, in a way with the intent of um, of uh, repressing it, and that, of course, is illegal under the First Amendment. Yeah, the government cannot repress political speech. Yeah, <laughs> or any kind of speech, as far as I'm concerned, but. At least, as far as court precedent is concerned, they at least can't repress political speech. Yeah. Well, the problem is, is so many people just think that you shouldn't be able to criticize the government of Israel at all. Yeah. That they absolutely can do no wrong, and whatever they want to do, they're welcome to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm finding a lot of people believe that. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, let's talk. Let's talk more about that in just a moment. I did want to make another point on this, though, um, before we get into your recent discussions with people. Uh, um, that I, I find it interesting that because um, the from the river to the sea stuff keeps coming up. Oh yeah, and that that's um, offensive and frightening to uh, Jews. And that therefore it is um, aggressive or uh, Hate violent speech. speech. Yeah. 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 Um, and so it shouldn't be used. I, I find it interesting that there is a whole group of people who um, were very critical of the idea of taking down statues because some people see that as uh, oppressive or violent, um, you know, of like uh, Civil War Southern Confederate generals and political leaders and so forth. And there's a group of people in this country that see that as oppressive. Um, shall I have to wait? <laughs> <laughs> um, that see that as oppressive. And uh, that there's a group of people that were saying, that's ridiculous. I shouldn't have to make changes about these things just because they feel that it's offensive or so forth, but have completely flipped that in this case with from the river to the sea, yeah. which isn't for the most part intended to be aggressive or violent speech to say that from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free yeah. is not the same as saying, kill all the Jews. Yeah. Well, because the, for me at least it's because Palestine is not free. These people, exactly. these people are living <laughs> under um, just horrible military occupation. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's the best way. I was trying to find the word, but military occupation is it. And so to have a chant to say that we don't want to live under military occupation anymore seems like that ought to be something fair to mm -hmm. to say. 
Yeah, and on the other side of it, the um, Netanyahu has himself said that from the river to the sea, Israel will be the only security force. Yeah, well, and that's what their intention is. Yeah. I mean, I guess they've about obtained it. And so that is, if from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free is uh, a threat against Jews, um, then from the river to the sea, uh, Israel will be the only security force is much more of a threat to the Palestinians. Absolutely. So, <laughs> Because uh, Israel actually has the power. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's um, to me that's the big difference here is that the you know because we are we're me and you particularly are very critical of Israel and and less so of the Palestinian side. Not mm-hmm. that I think what goes on on the Palestinian side is nice or correct or anything like that, but at the end of the day, the Israelis hold the power. And yeah. so that's the group that would be that needs to be held responsible. Well, but there's another side of that too. Um, we're very critical of the of the Israeli government. Yeah, and we're very critical of Hamas. Yeah, well, absolutely. We're not critical of the Jews living in Israel or no. the Palestinians living there. Yeah, um, these, that, these, that's really the difference. But the yeah. but the the leadership organizations one has power and one doesn't. Yeah, um, and so we spend a lot more time. Criticizing, criticizing the, the Israeli government because they're the ones with the power, not yeah. Hamas. And we're propping them up anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yeah. also a, a big factor is that, you know, part of the reason that they have that power is because we give that to, that to them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I will not deny that there is also some resentment that, um, that my tax money goes to uh, one of the richest countries in the world so that they can oppress their own people. Yeah. I mean, even if you're okay with them oppressing their own people, yeah. Israel is a wealthy nation. Why do they need my money yeah. to do that? They can pay for that themselves. Exactly. <laughs> and it's a half a world away, so it doesn't really concern me. <laughs> right. Palestinians are... The only way the Palestinians are attacking America is if we continue to support the Israeli government. Yeah. And it'll be through terrorism like mm-hmm. like any other group with no power. Yeah. So... Um, okay. So anyway, your recent discussions. Oh, I don't know. I didn't really, I wouldn't go anywhere with that really. Other than that, I've just, I don't even remember where I was going with it to begin with. (laughs) Uh, well, but you were talking to me about, um, partly the religious aspect of some people. And then, um, also the, I don't know, just the, the, uh, defenses that people were making of how the Israeli government is handling the situation. Yeah. Well, I, and, I have, and I don't remember all the things that you said, so you're just going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you this much. It, mm-hmm. it all kind of has me question in my own religion yeah. um, because just the, the, some of the defenses that like just the, the whole idea that Israel or that the Israelis throughout history have just wiped out civilizations and the fact that like mm-hmm. God just is okay with that because that's the chosen people. Like, that's not a part. Of, that's not any religion I want to be part of. Like I don't yeah. think any group should ever be wiped off the planet through genocide. Like mm-hmm. I just like I have a problem with that. Yeah. Um, so well, I mean, it goes back at least to Joshua in the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, where you know Joshua was the military leader when the uh, when the Jews came to the Promised Land, and and according to the Jews that wrote. The Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. Um, God told him to just go and uh, slaughter everybody that lived there. But it that, makes, that was the land for him, go in there and slaughter everyone. Yeah. But um, it makes me question how much of the Old Testament is truly the word of God and how much of it is truly the word of government at that time. Yeah. Like that's, <laughs> that's, and so more and more, that's kind of what I keep thinking to myself is okay, maybe some of this isn't really the word of God. This is just governments that that were in power at the time and mm-hmm. to the vi- justifying their actions, justifying their actions. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you know, the winners write the history, you know? So, right. I mean, how much of it is just that? Um, but I don't know, like I say, it's, there's def it's all of this more recent history has got me questioning a lot mm-hmm. of things. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, I don't want to turn this into just a um, religious discussion, but uh, there are significant differences in the attitudes from the Old Testament to the New Testament as yeah. well. Yeah. 
Um, well, and I so. tend to I tend to be more of a New Testament guy. <laughs> I I <laughs> like, figured. I mean, I figure like like those teachings are like the teachings I grew up on, and that I I, I have strong beliefs in. Um, yeah. The stuff from the Old Testament were I just I. Just, don't buy into that as much. Well, but that is the religious text of of Judaism. Of the of the origin of all three religions, right? Well, yeah, but um, but Judaism is the first, and Judaism, uh, for the most part, there are Messianic Jews, but for the most part, Judaism rejects that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Yeah. Um, and so, therefore, the New Testament isn't. <laughs> Isn't a hmm, it isn't a part of the base religious text. The Old Testament is the Torah, yeah. is the the religious text of Judaism, okay. um, and then the New Testament was added onto that as the religious text of Christianity. Yeah. And then the whole thing was rewritten in the Quran, which was, uh, according to Muhammad, was um, God's uh, message to the Arabs. Yeah. Which is also partly why, it, actually, that one's better preserved, oh, yeah. um, because it, it's actually I think only recently that they started translating into other languages with the Quran. Yeah. So a, a real Quran is written in Arabic. Yeah, only like right? completely unchanged, supposedly from the original, from the original transcriptions. Yeah. Um, whereas the the Bible and uh, and the Torah have both been rewritten into other languages over and over again, oh, translated back time, and forth. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So uh, we know that the King James version of the Bible, which is I th- still, I think still the most common, it's the standard as far as um, I know, at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was, um, was adjusted in some ways to uh, me- be more beautiful language yeah. and so forth. So, you know, it's not a direct translation in the sense that the Quran is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like even my copy of the Quran um, is translated into English, but it's well, obviously it's, you couldn't read it, right? Right. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't read Arabic, but yeah. um, the facing pages are. It's Arabic on one side, English on the other side. So it's got a. It's right next. So if you mm-hmm. if you spoke both, you could. Yeah. Compare. Compare them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I think the real purpose of that is for it to be a real Quran. It has to have that. It has to. Have it has both. to ha- be written or, in the original I, Arabic. It has to have the original. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, not hundred percent solid on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if anybody knows more about that, then feel free to e- email me. I Michael, feel like we have some Mike. listeners that probably do. Yeah. Um, so so I got a, like I got a whole shelf full of religious texts over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I. I uh, I started a comparative religions club in high school, I, which because I I've always found it fascinating. Um, the thing that I like when I talk to people is I I always try to understand why they believe what they believe, and these are some of the most heartfelt beliefs that people have, or like core beliefs. Religious beliefs are core beliefs. Yeah. Um, for most people, and uh, so I've always been interested in, um in religion and various ways of understanding the world anyway. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, I've got, uh, some Eastern stuff, which is tends to be more philosophical. Um, Western stuff tends to be more literary, yeah. like a lot of parables and, and stories to illustrate things. Um, you know, the morality is remarkably consistent. Yeah. Across these texts. Uh, I, anyway, yeah. Like I said, I didn't want to turn this into a religious discussion, but I do find... I, well, the morality one... I could start a new podcast on this, for sure. <laughs> right. Well, the morality one is the one that I find the most interesting, though, piece mm-hmm. that I find the most interesting, because to for me, at least, to fully back Israel, regardless of what they're doing, mm-hmm. takes a lack of morality. Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, I know... I mean, I'm sure I'll get a lot of pushback for that, but, mm-hmm. I mean, that's how I feel. Yeah. I mean, at, at some point, like... When is it enough? Yeah. For for those of you that support Israel's right to defend itself, okay, yeah, I, I agree. Everybody has a well, right to I, defend I them. I fully believe that, but the problem is that's not where we're at. Yeah. Like, like we said earlier, like they hold the power in the cards here. Mm-hmm. So 
Like they bear responsibility for for things that they do. Yeah, they have damaged or destroyed almost every single residential building in Gaza. Yeah, I saw something that to to get all the rubble out. It's going to take like fifteen years or something. I don't yeah. know, remember where I saw that, yeah. but like like I mean, we're talking like this place is level, dude. Yeah, they're trying to make it uninhabitable. Yeah, and make them stay there. Like, well, yeah. or drive them out. They yeah. just don't. They won't let them into their own country, and no other country is opening the doors either. Yeah. That's the so. problem. So they're they're either they either want to drive them down, drive them out, or eliminate them. Yeah, and yeah. if they can't drive them out, then they're perfectly content to eliminate them. Yeah, exactly. Which um, I mean, I just I can't I can't get behind that. Like, <laughs> no, good for you. <laughs> I mean, I just that's where I'm at. Yeah. Um, but I talk to plenty of people that can, and it just mm-hmm. and it, but it always goes back to religious stuff that I just don't buy into. So at least the conversations I've had, I've only talked to a handful of people about this type mm-hmm. of thing, but like the, that's where the conversation tends to lead. And I just, I was like, well, that, that just doesn't jive with me. Mm-hmm. So, Well, the, um, the attacks on October 7th uh, resulted in what, like, I, th- I think it was fewer than 1,500 yeah. uh, Israelis dead. As I remember, something like that. So now we're over 35,000. Yeah. Palestinians dead in Gaza. That's not even... I, oh, I should have gone and looked up the numbers. Um, That's the to number To find I've out heard. how many... Well, no, but I was thinking the other numbers, oh, which yeah. is how many Palestinians are, are dead on the West Bank that didn't have yeah. anything to do with that since yeah. October 7th. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know. Um, because the, the, uh, the settler... Um, the settlement of the West Bank has... Um, has intensified since October 7th. Okay. And the IDF obviously does not protect the Palestinians living in the West Bank. Yeah. So there's been a whole lot of Palestinians killed in the West Bank and driven off their land also Hmm. since October 7th. Um, I'm certain that it's over 100. How far over 100, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, But... You know, and so if you can, you can make the claim that this is about destroying Hamas, but Hamas doesn't exist in the West Bank. Yeah, and they're killing Palestinians there too. Yeah. So. Um. um a- anyway, the whole thing—it's a complete disaster, and it's uh, it reflects badly on the United States to continue to support it. Yeah. There is, you know, lip service paid to, well, you know, we keep telling the Israelis that they need to <laughs> not know, to be go more into Rafa. <laughs> yeah, that, for example. Yeah. Um, not to respond to the Iranian uh, response. Yeah. Um, yeah. Et cetera. They don't. They don't care what we have to say. No. Um, Which wouldn't bother me if they that weren't taking so much of our money. Yeah. I mean, the truth be told, like I say, if we weren't funding them. I wouldn't have as many bones about what was going on. <laughs> but that's oh, my I, money. I, I mean, mean yeah, I still would. I, yeah. I still would, but it it would hit different mm-hmm. if we were telling them to do X, Y, and Z, but they weren't taking our money. Like, yeah, if they, you know. I, I would still have a problem with what they were doing, but the idea of them ignoring what we're asking them to do wouldn't bother me as much. Yeah, um, if we weren't funding them. If we weren't funding it also. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, at some point, you got to be able to say, "Well, look, it's our money, so you're going to do it our way, or you're not going to get our money." Yeah, exactly. The unfortunate thing is that the government officials—it's not their money; it's our money. Yeah, <laughs> and so exactly. it's a whole lot easier to give other people's money away. Yeah, well, and so many people here support it anyway. Mm, I mean, that's that, true. from what I've seen, um, that'll flag over time, like Ukraine. Yeah, well, that's there's something to that. Although we're still giving plenty of money to Ukraine, too. Yeah, but people are unhappy about it. Oh, you got that right. <laughs> so. Uh, so um, oh, gosh. What else do we have on the agenda for tonight? Well, not not really much. I was going to say, I knew, you know, I'm looking at a very short list of notes over there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, okay, so another thing that I want, we, we keep putting off rent control and we're not going to talk about tonight either because um, yeah. we're 45 minutes in anyway and um, I'm tired of talking. I feel like I have a sand spur in the back of my throat. So, Ooh, yeah. Um, but I did want, this is just something that I'd been thinking about and it's something that comes up every once in a while 
And I, I guess I was thinking about it because we were talking about the um, the Kent State uh, shootings last week. And then, uh, and of course it was for Vietnam protests at the time. It was about the the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Yeah. But there were also a lot of protests throughout the United States during the course of the Vietnam War about the draft. Yeah. Yeah, and, we didn't really touch on that last week, but that was that was really a root of the protest, right? Um, at that particular point in time, no. Okay. Uh, th- those protests were all sparked. The major protests that happened across the country at the beginning of May in 1970 were sparked by the invasion of Cambodia, the okay. announcement of the invasion of Cambodia. Gotcha. Um, but because they were supposed to be winding down the war. Yeah. And then we started not winding down the war. Exactly. <laughs> so, but there there had been, you know, on the whole, yeah. college campus protests uh, through for through the course of the Vietnam War were mostly about the draft. Okay. Um, I think, and about the war itself, that we just shouldn't be involved. But there were a lot of draft protests yeah. because these are the kids that were going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not so much the college kids, but but yeah, but they're. Know. People their age, right. kids their age. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and uh, they ended the draft after the Vietnam War, but then they reinstituted the, the selective service during the Reagan administration. So you still had to register for the draft, even though there wasn't actually cons- conscription going on. Yeah. Um, but they just made it so that if they ever decided they wanted it, they, they could immediately <laughs> yeah, uh, reinstitute conscription, which is yeah. a terrible idea. Which is still going on today, right? Yes. I was going to say, because I, I know I filled out the selective service stuff when I turned 18. Yeah. Uh, I assume Your that's... daughter might have. I, I can't remember if they made that change. That was something that they were discussing I not that long ago, is whether they were going to require women to register that's, for selective that, now service Now that you too. mentioned that, that's a good... I'll have to look into that, but I'm pretty sure she didn't. Yeah. It seems like that would have came across my radar if it had, but, yeah. but maybe not. Like, yeah. maybe well, maybe they decided not to do it. I, I remember that discussion, though, um, not that long ago, where they the argument wasn't about whether to, to um, end selective service uh, registration, but whether women should to have to do it, too. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, to be fair. <laughs> right, equality and all. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk, it, like, it comes up every so often, and we talked about it certainly within the last year when they started talking again about, well, military recruitment is way down. Um, they're not getting the number of recruits that they need to fill all the military slots that they need to fill. Um, and then they start discussing whether they should reinstitute conscription or... Um, do like Israel and require military service of everybody uh, or, well, it's not necessarily military service, but, um, but uh, federal service for everybody. Okay. Yeah. I knew Um, they had something like that, but I wasn't sure. Civil service requirements, you know? Yeah. Um, Go work at the DV DMV (laughs) for six months or a year. Can you imagine? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The, The people that are there now, they took that job. <laughs> right. <laughs> Imagine the people that got conscripted for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> never, oh. line would never move. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of the point, first off, is yeah. that a, a conscript army isn't a very good one. No, never is. <laughs> and, uh, but the other thing, that, what I wanted to focus on here is that, first off, the, the, principles that the United States, the ideas of uh, natural rights that the United States was founded on, kind of preempt the idea of conscription. Yeah. I mean, we can say that easy enough. There was slavery at the beginning, but the Constitution was written with the intent of eliminating slavery over time. It just didn't work like they wanted. Yeah. And and conscription is a form of slavery. Yeah. Well, 100%. Yeah. So... It it goes against the principles that that the nation was founded on, um, really about individual freedom, freedom to make your own choice choices about your life. Um, but the the most important thing that it does is that it it actually kind of hamstrings government into only entering into military engagements that they can get people behind. Yeah. Because with an all volunteer force. If you are, it kind of limits military adventurism 
because of the problem that they're having right now. Yeah. <laughs> people just don't want to go do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, if people don't see a purpose, don't see a value um, for this nation of going and fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and Somalia and Sudan and wherever else we might send them, <laughs> right. go to Taiwan, yeah. go to Ukraine, <laughs> go to Israel, yeah. whatever it happens to be, um, then uh, they just won't join. Yeah. And if you don't have the soldiers to send to fight in all these places that people don't approve of us going to fight, then you can't really do it. However, if you have conscription, there's no popular limitation on where the government can, can employ the military. Yeah. Because if you go a bunch of places that people don't want, that you don't have popular support for, you're not dependent on them volunteering for your army to do it. Yeah. Just snatch a bunch of them up and go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For lack of a better... So, um, I'm not entirely sure what I'm saying here in the long run. I maybe I'm, maybe I'm saying that we should push for an elimination of selective service again. Yeah. I mean, I would be for that. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, you know, there's like a couple of things that limit, a, a government's ability to wage war. Yeah. One is having enough soldiers to fight the war. Ukraine's learning that right now, by yeah, the way. They are. Um, actually, I suppose they're, they're not really learning the other lesson, which is that you have to have money. Yeah. Well, we're taking care of that. Yeah. Um, at the expense of the next generation and the generation after that, of course, I tell you, Ukraine's in trouble in the future. Like they they have just decimated their population. Oh yeah, I meant for us though with the oh, money. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, creating money out of nothing to send to to Ukraine, oh, yeah. just printing that. Yeah, yeah um, is going to uh, inflate away the dollar, and and then of course it just makes the next generation poorer and the next generation poorer. Yeah, in this country. Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so those are the two things. If you don't have the soldiers to fight, you can't fight. And if you don't have the money, you can't fight. The government in this country has taken care of the money problem. Yeah, so far. Yeah, unless there, <laughs> there's got to be a lot of things reversed in the Fed. That's yeah. my other argument. Yeah. In the Fed, in selective service. That's a, <laughs> hey, if I could have two things. <laughs> yeah. Um, right now, at yeah. this very moment. And eliminate <laughs> nuclear weapons. Yeah, well, that's probably three things. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'll settle for the first two. I, yeah. I can actually see some value of nuclear weapons, although I'm, you know, I think that they should be eliminated worldwide. Yeah. Um, but you know the <laughs> the it, world being what it is, it does create a deterrent. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, uh, until it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> But um, eliminate selective service, eliminate the Fed. But the, the government's already taken care of the money problem. Yeah. They have the Federal Reserve. They can create money out of nothing. They never run out of money for war. They yeah. will never run out of money for war because if they need more money for war, they just print it. And that's always been the case. Yeah. Um, you should see the inflation rates during the course of the Revolutionary War in this country. Really? When, yeah, when all these states went to um, fiat currency, moved away from gold and silver and went to fiat currency to fund the war and yeah. just started creating money out of nothing. Um, I mean, there are inflation rates for the course of the Revolutionary War in some states that were between like three and 8,000%. Wow. <laughs> just printing it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. To the point where they they started doing better by paying soldiers in, in food. I was going to say in commodities. <laughs> yeah. Instead of giving them paper that was worthless. Yeah. This is worthless. This is toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we're doing the same thing now. And it's because yeah. of the ability to control the money supply that the, um, the United States has been at, in a constant state of war for like a century. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Couldn't do that without the, that. We're the reserve currency, and we can print as much of it as we like. Yeah, well, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Well, it's a recipe for disaster, but like I almost that's what pulled we're the doing. clip. Do you hear the guy um, trying to explain where money came from? Oh my god, that was hard to listen to. <laughs> god, well, that was hard to listen to. <laughs> I wish to, you had pulled it. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to pull that clip. Well, I I just, I just didn't want to talk about that tonight, but. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, definitely pull that. I can explain that for people, more or less. (laughs) But my favorite part of it is he says, uh, "Well, he just gives up." (laughs) Modern monetary theory is kind of confusing, and yet nobody understands modern monetary theory because it's BS. (laughs) Because it doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's all made up to excuse the way that governments function. It doesn't. Yeah. Governments don't function the way they do because of modern monetary theory. Modern monetary theory was created to explain why governments function the way they right. do. Uh, anyway, um, but the other thing, the thing that we ought to be able to control in what we call a free country is the availability of soldiers. Yeah. And um, by eliminating uh, the possibility of conscription, you do um, rein in your government to some degree that they can't just go off and fight a bunch of unpopular wars everywhere because they just won't have the people to fight them. Exactly. Um, the What's happening now is exactly what you want in a free society. Yeah. You can't fill the ranks of the military because the government has been engaged in military operations that the people don't support. Yeah. It's exactly what you want. That all over the world that aren't even like intimate mm. threats or anything. Yeah. Like just running the empire. Precisely. So, um, yeah, let's end there. Uh, end the Fed, end Selective Service. I like it. <laughs> we'll, we'll start a campaign. I'll, I'll push it at the Libertarian Convention. <laughs> we can have t-shirts made. <laughs> yeah. I've been asking your wife for t-shirts for a while. Yeah, she's not really in the t-shirt business anymore. <laughs> no, I know. It sucks. I need to find somebody else. Oh, anybody else does t-shirts? We've got some things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would really like a new Liberty Mike t-shirt to go to the convention. Or even a taxationist theft t-shirt. Yeah. But I, I guess I won't get either. I was going to say, we're hammering pretty close to convention time here to get shirts made. That's true. That's true. So. It might be too late for this year. Yeah. Um, so we'll, let's see. Today's the ninth. Yeah. So we'll be back next week. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Like and share, comment, subscribe, uh, leave reviews. You can always email me, michael at thelibertymike.com. I will be at the Libertarian Convention um, in D.C. on the 23rd. So if you're going to be there, like hit me up. Yep. Uh, you got my email address. Yeah, right. I get that. <laughs> and he checks it. <laughs> I do check it most of the time. Periodically, right? <laughs> <laughs> at least once a day. Yeah. And yeah, That's uh, a lot as far as I'm concerned with yeah. the email. <laughs> like, I'm doing good for a once a month on mine. Yeah, don't email. <laughs> yeah, don't bother. <laughs> don't email Gary. He yeah. actually has the Liberty Mike address. And it's, yeah, don't bother. <laughs> yeah, it's worthless. I don't yeah. know why I even created it for him. Um, so, uh, but we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.